Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jen Schleter, and I'm Dean of Graduate Studies here at Columbus College of Art and Design, a nonprofit art and design college that has been a creative force within Central Ohio for more than 140 years. I want to welcome you to today's event, part of the CCAD Knows Retail webinar series featuring industry leaders who share their insight about the retail landscape and what's on its horizon. Before we jump into today's talk and I introduce our speaker, I wanted to share a housekeeping note or two. Um, first, we're recording today's talk so we can share it on our website for those who weren't able to join us. Today's event is in a webinar format and all lines are muted and videos are off other than for the speakers. And we will have time to answer your questions at the end. So please feel free to use that Q&A function throughout the discussion to submit them or to use the chat throughout to share any reactions or comments. Um, now I'm really excited to introduce today's speaker. Jonathan Nodell is a 2005 graduate from the industrial design program at CCAD. Throughout his 16 year career, he has worked to create unique customer experiences for a wide range of brands, including M&M's Candy, Hamley's Toy Stores, and most recently as design director at GH&A Design Studios, where his team helped develop the first brick and mortar store for the Rolling Stones located on Carnaby Street in London. He was also recently included in Design Retail's 40 Under 40 Class of 2022. Welcome, Jonathan, take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jen, for that introduction. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen and then uh, we can get into it. So um, I'm here to talk about uh, immersive uh, experiential retail and what exactly that means and uh, how I think um, it can um, start to pave the way for where retail is going uh, in this rapidly changing landscape. Uh, but first, because I'm a CCAD alum and um, you know, really excited to be a part of this um, MPS program, I thought it'd be interesting to just draw some parallels with kind of how I got to where I am today, uh, because I think one of the um, one of the key drivers and most exciting things that I find with the MPS program, which is this uh, wide um, range of um, industry leaders and talents uh, across the Columbus area and beyond. That are contributing to building the syllabus. I think that's you know vitally important. And you know when I look at my own personal career and how I got to be sitting in front of you all today, uh, there's definitely a direct link between some of those connections and you know working with some of those industry professionals, um, and um, and how it related you know from my college experience. So just wanted to spend a couple minutes on that. So uh, as Jennifer or Jen said, uh, I came from the industrial design program. And you know, spent a few classes, you know, building models and drawing sketches of toasters, and probably wanted to design cars. And my professor at the time, uh, Joel Gunlock, he was also teaching interior design drawing, and he knew that I was, um, you know, had had a real strength in the um, in sketching and in ideation and that sort of thing. So he suggested that I take his drawing class. And so I did. I figured, you know, worst case gives me a fairly easy elective and uh, gives me a chance to, uh, you know, draw pictures a little bit more. And uh, you know, didn't seem too many uh, too many downsides to that. So I signed up for that class. And um, one day at that class, uh, I came into uh, we were came into the classroom and there was a uh, a friend of his that was speaking and doing a. He was doing a drawing demonstration, and his name was Tom Spade, who um, some professionals, if you're listening and you probably know the name, he made the rounds of some of the big uh, retail design firms around Columbus uh, throughout the 90s. And um, he proceeded to do a drawing demonstration and sort of got it was like, you know, watching electricity being uh, presented or demonstrated to me for the first time. Like there was something in the way he was sketching and the way he was using markers to create this uh, very gestural, emotional sketch that had a lot of uh, life and vibrancy. Um, I didn't know what it was or you know what this industry was that he was coming from, you know, retail design, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> Whatever it took for me to get uh, to do that 
for the rest of my career. You know, that it was one of those spark moments um, that kind of, I think, changed the trajectory of, uh, you know, the rest of my time at CCAD and also, you know, uh, beyond that, my career. So um, after that, I took more retail design classes or more, sorry, more interior design classes, any ones that I could kind of fit into my schedule. And one of those being a retail design class um, at the time, it was taught by um, Brian Seitz, who's uh, now with WD Partners. And um, that class went well. It was really exciting and, you know, really told me that that's what I wanted to be doing. And um, as an, an industry professional himself, he had connections um, for, you know, guest lectures and uh, class critiques and stuff. So with um, the end of our final project, he had the creative director from Shoot Erdemann uh, sit in on that, uh, on that class critique. The critique went really well. He had a lot of great things to say about my work. And so I um, did what any uh, aspiring student would do. And I, you know, attacked him after class and asked him for a portfolio review as, um, which was actually required as part of my uh, portfolio class at the time. We had to have our portfolios reviewed by somebody in the industry. So I asked him to do that and he obliged. And I went to uh, Shoot Gerdeman for a, what ended up being basically a job interview. I didn't know it at the time, but um, it was a chance to sit down and go through my portfolio with some of the, uh, the top creative people there. And uh, what came from that was an opportunity to do some freelance work uh, while I was still in college. So a couple of weeks later from that interview, I was uh, walked into the, class, or into the office at CCAD, entered this um, one of their war rooms, and there was um, Brian Shaffley, the president at the time, and none other than Tom Spade sitting there um, drawing uh, crazy uh, freehand gestural sketches of uh, what would become uh, the initial ideas for the M&M's world in Orlando. So I got to participate at the, in the early onset of this amazing project, throwing out crazy ideas, um, you know, vending machines, claw machines, giant, you know, M&M's characters taking over the store. Uh, it was really an amazing uh, introduction into this world of, you know, more experiential retail uh, from a more of a thematic approach. So um, I, I stuck around there for a few years and we worked on the Times Square store as well, as well as uh, the Hamley store uh, in uh, Dubai and Regent Street. So a, a really wide breadth of chances to explore this idea of taking a brand and really um, extrapolating it in, into a full environment and creating uh, this immersive experiential uh, store. So from there, uh, the last 15 years, or 13 years, sorry, I've been at uh, GHA Design. We're based in Montreal and uh, Detroit, uh, even though I'm here in Chicago. And I've had a chance to work on, again, a, a wide range of uh, projects, including some that really allowed us to sort of push the boundaries a little bit on what experiential retail could be. So we uh, had a chance to do uh, the Times Square uh, flagship store for Aeropostale. And this was an opportunity to um, really you know, announce them to the world. And we really pushed and tried to throw everything we could at them, cafes and vending machines and after hours, pop-up shops, and a lot of things that, you know, now are starting to become mainstream. We were throwing everything we could at them. And, um, you know, it was a little bit ahead of its time and a lot of retailers were kind of afraid to go there, but nevertheless, really a fun experience. And then most recently, uh, working on RS number nine Carnaby, which is the first ever uh, gift shop or a, a merchandise store for the Rolling Stones. So again, we tried to create a space that was very immersive and experiential through bringing their lyrics to life and graphic treatments throughout the store and creating a space that can flex to allow for some uh, after hours events and product launches and that sort of thing. So um, really had a, a wide breadth of experiences and in, 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 uh, experience in creating some of these spaces that uh, try to push the boundaries of kind of what a store could be or should be, uh, which brings us to where we're, uh, where we're at today. So experiential retail, uh, what is it? Uh, sorry, one second. What is it? Uh, why does it matter? 
And is there a selfie wall involved? And short answer to that, no, but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, it's, a, it's a big word that I think it's been um, reinterpreted by brands a lot of different ways for better or worse. Um, so uh, just wanting to dive a little bit into what, it, what I think it means and what I think it can mean in, uh, in the industry. So as we get into it, I think it's important to kind of look back at uh, you know, retail from a bygone era and what, um, what experiential retail used to be or just basically what retail used to be. And this idea of going to this glamorous department store, being catered to by a salesperson who probably knew your name, uh, who guided you through uh, the design or the, the shopping process from start to finish, you know, gift wrapped your... Uh, whatever you purchased, put a nice bow on it, and then maybe even called you up a few days later to make sure you were happy with the purchase. So this real tailored one-on-one -on -one service um, used to be the norm, and that really was the experience. It was really being catered to in, in, in a personalized and, and honest way. Um, things obviously have changed uh, since then, and uh, as retail has become a bit more of a commodity. And um, so as we look at what experience kind of was, uh, experiential retail was after that, it was really this idea of a passive experience, as I like to say. So it's, you know, come on in, uh, you know, look around, you know, it's all about the environment and then buy and make your purchase and then, and then leave. So really a passive experience, no real one-on-one uh, -on -one connection with the customer, just um, really just uh, an environment that's there and then uh, the, the product that's there for purchase. So it, Looking at that, you know, Hollister and uh, Abercrombie really started to pave the way for this type of retail in the in the early two thousands, um, creating these immersive, you know, beach cabanas in the middle of malls um, that were major disruptors uh, in the industry when they came out. Um, you know, breaking it, changing up the shape of the lease line, and then when you went inside, the you know really low light levels, the overwhelming smell of whatever their uh, their scent was at that time, it really created food that reinforces this idea of exclusivity fitting into their brand. Um, and then taking that a step further with their short-lived rural um, brand, which was kind of the higher end, uh, grown-up Abercrombie. So this when this store opened there in Columbus at Easton, like our minds were blown. Like it was this weird, bizarrely out of scale West Village streetscape. And then you went inside and it was like dangerously dark. Like you just, you literally could not see your hand in front of your face. And there was models lounging around on couches. And uh, it, was a, it was a type of experience where you either went in and knew you belonged or you immediately wanted to leave. And there wasn't really any uh, variation or any uh, gray area in there. So they were creating an experience, um, again, all about exclusivity and, um, but there wasn't that extra layer of engagement, you know, and on top of that, it was really just about, you know, creating that mood in the store. Other brands tried to do similar things. Lucky took more of this nostalgic Americana approach, trying to harken back to this general store with a lot of expensive propping and found industrial objects, creating these really rich layered, uh, layered environments. And then, of course, uh, an example like All Saints, which sort of took that uh, ethos to its, uh, you know, to its maximum degree, where, you know, buying up every Singer sewing machine within a hundred mile radius, and you know. Re salvaging these uh, industrial workbenches and uh, things from the uh, you know the fabric industry, turning them into fixtures, and just creating all of this theater in the store um, in a really over the top way that uh, really created this immersive experience. It really transported you to a different world for a few moments while you were in the store. Even Bass Pro Shops, outside of fashion, Bass Pro Shops created this hunting lodge. Uh, over the top, Willy Wonka, airplanes hanging from the ceiling, taxidermy. Uh, again, just trying to uh, do whatever they could to create this sort of destination where you knew you were going to go there. They were going to be the experts for you know all things outdoors. And then, kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, in within the luxury realm, you had brands like Longchamp or uh, Prada who were 
you know, pushing the idea of experiential retail from the standpoint of architecture and just creating this beautiful space that really started to stretch the idea of what a, a traditional store could be. So creating a space that's um, it's more of a showpiece, you know, it, they might have some fashion runway shows that happen. And really this architecture almost takes a, a, a starring role and the product is almost secondary. So you just the experience is it's a place that you have to go and see the store, you know, tell your friends about it. Um, but again, it's a very passive, uh, like I, I think a very passive experience. And then we kind of went into this world of fast fashion, you know, it's triggered by the great recession, you know, the, the ex in-store experience really became uh, non-existent in this idea that it was all about getting the clothes or the product into the customer's hands as fast and, and efficient as possible. So um, the usual players were involved and you could really interchange the names uh, between the three of these and you really you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. There was really no uh, per perceivable in-store experience other than you know fighting somebody for uh, that last size large top or whatever it is. Um, it was really just getting the product from the factory into the customer's hands. So experience really took a kind of a nosedive in the mid to late, you know, 20, you know, late 2000s. And then something weird happened. So the, the 2010s gave us Instagram and uh, retail, I think, thought it was going to, you know, change the world of retail and make it, uh, you know, it was, like, it was going to be the way forward. So for a couple of years, uh, Instagrammable stores and social media engagement was all the rage in retail. It was really, uh, every retailer was coming to us and saying, we need this, we need this. You know, how do we take our existing store, not change anything else, but then have like an Instagram wall in the corner with a fake Ivy backdrop and the neon sign. So, um, and this was, this kind of was what would be considered experiential retail for a short time. And then of course, uh, COVID happened and it really turned everything on its head. And um, it made uh, you know, a lot of uh, people in our industry uh, pretty scared about what the future held. And uh, I know a lot of our clients were scared and uh, it wasn't really, uh, there was a lot of ambiguity going around and a lot of mixed messages about kind of what the future of retail um, was going to be. And there was, uh, a whole new uh, industry or a whole new um, uh, genre of industry articles popped up all about the retail apocalypse and all the ways that uh, we were all going to be out of jobs. Every store was going to close, you know, the you know, shopping you know, in brick and mortar stores as we knew it was over. And, you know, and certainly some brands, you know, did not respond uh, very well to um, the pandemic and what came from that. And certainly the uh, realization that Amazon and companies like that can bring everything to us, you know, at our fingertips, you know, on the same day or next day really um, took a number or took a toll on a lot of uh, retail brands. Um, but I think what's important to see or kind of look through the fog is to see that a lot of those brands that maybe didn't fare so well were already on maybe borrowed time. Uh, so what started to be realized was that the pandemic wasn't changing things or wasn't um, creating a new course for where retail was going. It was just kind of speeding things up uh, and making us realize that we had to respond faster as, you know, as designers and uh, be ready to think about what was, uh, you know, coming next. But fortunately, there you know there is light at the end of the tunnel. You know, as people get vaccinated and uh, we start returning to various forms of normalcy, uh, it's important to know that you know people still crave a human touch. You know, and interacting with uh, like-minded individuals and people want to be inspired. You know, our, our priorities have changed in the last uh, eighteen months to two years. You know, there's been an, uh, an overwhelming you know uh, social uprising and. Uh, 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 concerns about you know global warming and the environment, and so there's definitely this perception that you know maybe people don't want to go back to normal. You know we you know kind of exposed some uh, uh, some things that maybe needed to change you know worldwide, but then that also translates you know down to our industry, which um, you know we're 
we're retailers. We're not really always the most altruistic. Um, you know, we are, you know, uh, capitalist, you know, if you will. But um, there's a chance for us to start to look at how what's going on in the world can start to change what we're doing in a store and then how that, inter, you know, goes into what that in-store experience could be. So uh, what a lot of brands have realized is that, you know, a store isn't necessarily essential for them running their business anymore. You can get a car delivered to you, a mattress, all your groceries, you know, in, in a lot of different ways, um, a store is not an essential part of a business model anymore. So if a brand is going to be taking that step and that investment uh, to open a brick and mortar store, you know, why, what is that purpose? You know, it's not just um, getting, you know, it's not just selling the product anymore because that can happen, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's really a chance to, you know, reinvent um, what that store experience can be. And so I think it's kind of pushing us towards um, what could be seen as a bit of a retail renaissance. So, you know, going back to that first slide inside that old department store, you know, starting to look back at, you know, what used to work, what didn't work, and really starting to recreate or um, uh, reevaluate, you know, what makes a great shopping experience. Um, and so, um, when we look at you know what's going on in the market today, there's there's a few brands that are sort of um, you know marching forward and kind of paving this new way for what retail uh, in the in the retail experience can be. And so there's a lot of these brands that are uh, they started out as um, digital you know only brands. They only had e-commerce stores, and so then when they come into the retail. Uh, arena or the brick and mortar arena, they don't have all that excess baggage of um, what a store used to be or should be or how it should operate. And they're able to bring a really a fresh perspective. So you have um, brands like Glossier who are really creating these uh, multifunctional um, destinations where, you know, you're going in for a product launch, there's, you know, expert stylists on site, there's a cafe involved. Um, there's, they're offering lots of add-on experiences and it's really all about pushing the service side of things, uh, that reinforces kind of the brand, uh, the brand ethos, if you will. Or looking at Kith, for example, who have stores, um, in New York city and then there's stores in uh, Japan and elsewhere, uh, around the world. And they've really taken this idea of creating, um, the sneaker culture and kind of elevating it to the level of high art and working with um, a really avant-garde architecture firm called Snarkitecture. They've um, created these temples to, you know, streetwear culture and fashion and really um, bridge the gap between, uh, you know, streetwear and high fashion. Uh, so again, it's, it's a space where, um, it's inspirational. You really want to go there and you know, hang out. There's events. There's places to have product launches, celebrity, uh, you know, celebrity meet, uh, meet and greets, and then you know, having any add-on services um, as well. So they're really um, taking a new path forward uh, as far as what that store space uh, should be. Or looking at 4510, um, this is a store that um, was located in Hudson Yards. They recently closed um, uh, due to the pandemic and maybe some, some real estate issues and uh, location issues. But um, it's uh, a brand that really uh, pushed the boundaries of, of blending this idea of high art and, uh, and fashion. So creating these sort of Willy Wonka environments where um, you have your, you have a curated art and there's, uh, and then you have the product that's kind of placed within context of it and it sort of elevates the product to that level of art. Um, and then also it's just this, you know, beautiful environment where people always, you know, you want to come take pictures. So you do have that sort of social media side of things um, to, uh, to, you know, share with, you know, with, with all of their friends, but it's really about this idea of um, blending this art gallery and uh, 
you know, high fashion concept. Or looking at what Apple is doing, and, and Apple's been one of you know the leaders in uh, really pushing the retail um, you know retail experience for for a number of years with having a place where even if you're not an avid avid Apple customer, you want to go, you want to hang out, you want to play with the products, you want to be inspired, and then if you are an Apple customer, you know taking advantage of classes, the Genius Bar, and there's a lot of levels of experience to help you know keep you in store, bring you back really build that brand, uh, you know, that brand loyalty. So looking at what they did here at the uh, Tower Theater store in Los Angeles, where they're, um, you know, one of the only companies or you know, entities willing to go in and uh, save uh, some of these architectural gems like the Tower Theater and, and renovate it for a new use and a new life. So um, this in its own way is experiential retail because you just, you, you know, you need to go there and see it and, you know, it's kind of bask in the grandeur of the architecture and what they've uh, done at renovating it. And then of course, um, you have Apple and, and all of their amazing offerings as well. So really uh, pushing the boundaries for what, you know, experiential retail or what this kind of future model of retail could be. So that, um, Kind of brings me to the next point, which is this idea of active engagement. So it's it's not this passive come in, kind of enjoy the environment, make your purchase and get out. It's this idea of how can you connect with the customer in a meaningful way that's you know authentic to the brand's DNA. So you're working to build that brand loyalty, that brand awareness, um, and doing it in a way that's uh, you know a, true to you who you are as a or to these what these brands are and. Um, really keeps that customer engaged. So the first category uh, is uh, product testing. So helping that customer, you know, find that per perfect product uh, for whatever their lifestyle needs are. Um, so if you look at Canada Goose and what they're doing with their cold room uh, test rooms in, uh, in many of their stores. So they have these um, experiential minus uh, 15 minus 16 degree Fahrenheit, you know, blast freezers that you can, you know, wear their parkas and step inside and really test and, and understand why, you know, their products, you know, command a high price point and uh, why they're sort of the industry leaders um, in this, um, you know, very you know, harsh weather uh, apparel. So some of their, uh, their, their cold rooms have, you know, ice sculptures, some have uh, immersive uh, projections and their um, their newest store that's going to be opening soon in Los Angeles is going to have actually um, you know real snow. It's going to snow inside the cold room, so just really creating this layer of experience where you, you just want to go and try it out and you know step into this freezing box and um, you know understand why you know spending fifteen sixteen hundred dollars on a you know a winter parka you know may actually be you know, a good investment. Or looking at Casper Dreamery, which again is this company that came from the digital world first. So they didn't have any of these um, strings kind of holding them back when they wanted to get into retail, into brick and mortar. So they created this uh, concept in New York where you could actually rent one of these little pods for 45 minutes and you go in and you get pajamas, you get uh, skincare uh, product samples and you get to relax and, uh, away from the you know, chaos of New York City for, um, I think it's 45 minutes. And then, you know, when they're done, they'll give you a cup of coffee and kind of send you on your way. So this idea of um, really offering a service to customers to build that brand loyalty and really kind of letting you escape from uh, the hustle and bustle of New York City for a few minutes. Um, so it immediately just builds that kind of goodwill, those warm and fuzzy feelings that, okay, this company cares about me. They have great products, you know, and really, um, you know, drive customers then back to their e-commerce site or to even any of their other uh, brick and mortar stores. And a third example of this could be uh, On Running, which is a, a fairly new store in New York City. And their whole, um, their whole brand ethos is this idea of um, creating an escape uh, through running and they really wanted uh, technology to be a driving force in their stores, but not to be uh, a hindrance or not the customer not to be encumbered by 
you know, clunky scanners and devices and things that may, you know, other stores have been using to um, sort of evaluate what product might be best for the customers. So instead they created this long, uh, 60 foot long wall full of sensors and it's all invisible. You run in front of it, it analyzes your gate and then they can immediately tell you, you know, what type of insole arch, you know, what type of uh, footwear is best for you. And they've also worked in some unique and clever storytelling into the stores. For example, that orange rock, it was actually a 3D printed replica of a rock that they uh, were hiking past in the Swiss Alps when they started to uh, you know, have the initial conversations of starting uh, this brand. So trying to bring that, uh, the storytelling in, tell a bit of their history uh, in an iconic way in the store. Uh, the next category that is a really great way to bring this experiential element into a store is through education. So helping somebody you know, understand a product's features and benefits, or maybe even inspiring them to uh, use a product in new ways. Um, so the one of the biggest um, uh, best practices are, uh, in this, in, in this uh, category is Eataly, and they've been doing it for a while. It's not a new concept, but they continually come up as one of the go-to uh, examples of how to bring you know, education and inspiration into the stores. So you have this great synergy between um, their restaurant spaces with the product that you can purchase, and then layering in with that, this really great uh, informational wayfinding and telling you about whether it's regions in Italy, uh, different types of pasta and why it matters, what pasta you do use when and with what sauce. Um, so they're really educating you in a, in, a, in a passive subdued way as you go through the store. So you're just learning, you're eating, you're shopping, and it's just really this holistic approach to, um, to educating people and you know, the vast uh, expanse of uh, Italian culinary uh, cooking and ingredients and, and all that. In addition to that, they often have, you know, actual cooking classes and celebrity uh, cooking demonstrations and stuff in stores. So just added layers of, you know, uh, of experience, of demonstration, education. Uh, it's really, uh, they really continue to be one of the benchmarks in that. And then another example would be Dyson, who sells, um, very, very high end, you know, housewares, you know, uh, vacuums we all know, but they also have $600 hair dryers and air purifiers and fans. So it's really important for them because, you know, most of us aren't um, aeronautical engineers and we can't understand why they have so much technology in this product that justifies, you know, these, um, the high price point. So they've created these really immersive experiences. Uh, with a ton of digital content to talk about how the products are constructed and the craftsmanship. But then at product level, they have the ability to, as a customer, touch and feel and interact with every single product there. So you understand why this vacuum cleaner is, uh, you know, 10 times better than, you know, a vacuum cleaner you get at a department store or a Target and kind of helping you justify, you know, the product uh, price point. So it's kind of demystifying uh, a lot of this technology that uh, Dyson is famous for. So um, really a good example of how education can really bring that experience into the retail space. Uh, the next example is uh, community. And I think this one is you know, one of the most important, um, especially today as we look at coming back from COVID and getting back out there and uh, communicating and connecting and being social with people. So the idea of community and these, uh, these examples um, is that there's these brands that are doing something above and beyond just offering a retail store or selling space uh, to really just amplify um, and, and better their customers' lives uh, or you know, be become a, um, a whole expression of what that brand ethos is within a built environment. So if you look at Lululemon, who uh, recently opened a store here in Chicago a couple of years ago, and um, really the store aspect of it is secondary. You can go in and buy your leggings and your tops and all of that equipment, but it's more about this meditation space, about this yoga classes, um, and about really creating a space that, um, again, it's just this respite from you know, busy city life and really allows Lululemon to um, convey all of their 
you know, their brand ethos in a, in, in the built environment. So creating this experience through, you know, connecting at this, at this classroom and in workshop level, and they also have a cafe and some other uh, offerings as well. So it's really this hub uh, of like kind of the yoga community within, uh, within the neighborhood. And doing a similar thing, but in a completely different fashion is House of Vans uh, in London, who uh, moved into this really unique underground industrial space uh, in the south side of London and created this hub for um, many different uses. So they have, uh, you know, a skate park where you can, you know, film you can, you know, shoot little promo videos if you're kind of an aspiring, uh, you know, skater in, in, in the scene. They have um, concert venues where they have, uh, you know, top tier talents uh, that comes through and will do two, uh, concerts there. And so it's really this meeting and gathering space for people in this um, very specific uh, culture or scene. So uh, it's really a great way to sort of build that brand equity in a, in a, in a subdued way where you're not talking about selling them product, you're just giving them a space where they can come and kind of uh, share their passion for, um, for their craft or for their art, for their sport with, uh, with like-minded people. And then a third example is camp in New York City. So from the street front, camp looks like a um, fairly normal uh, kid store selling a range of uh, curated outdoorsy type products. But then uh, once you enter through the secret bookcase uh, doorway, you uh, enter this whole new world of uh, exploration and playing and discovery all for kids. So it's really this idea of escaping to camp, uh, escaping to summer camp um, in this um, over the top thematic environment that changes. Um, and every three, six months, um, it'll, it'll change to a completely different uh, type, uh, type of activities. And so throughout the space, there's places where you can you know, purchase products. So there's definitely that transactional aspect to it, but it's really about um, just creating this goodwill through uh, allowing parents to take their kids in and let them run around. There's, um, there was, the last time I was there, there was a magic demonstration going on in the back and they had a place for um, uh, comic uh, improv comedy workshops. So really just creating these layers of activity and adventure and engagement for, uh, for kids that kind of has this sort of secret clandestine um, idea around it. And again, experiential and taking people, you know, out of this, you know, very, very busy, hectic New York City, Manhattan uh, environment, and then just transporting them somewhere else for a few minutes and letting them forget about whatever their other concerns were and worries were. Um, and just really enjoying this fantastical uh, environment. Uh, I think that's really uh, a great or it's really what this idea of building this community is, uh, is all about. Uh, another way that um, retailers are really starting to look at bringing uh, this experience to their customers is through localization. So allowing brands to uh, test out smaller footprint stores. So from a logistical and real estate standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but also allowing them to go directly to consumers in their communities um, in an authentic way um, to, uh, to offer them uh, the services they need. So uh, Nike is doing a really great job of this. And um, so they have stores uh, like this in a few different locations, uh, but this Nike Melrose store um, it's again, it's a smaller format store. It's built around um, the, the data that they've collected through all of their e-commerce, their vast e-commerce and, um, and other sources. So it's a really a tailored store for this community. Um, they work with a local artist to craft the storefront, uh, storefront murals. So you're really automatically, you're trying to build some, um, some, some local you know, authenticity and just really getting the community involved. And then inside, it's a really a multi-use space that uh, offers a wide range of services from a sneaker bar to help you choose the right product, uh, testing facilities so you can try out those sneakers on a treadmill, um, 
with all of the e-commerce uh, becoming such a, a bigger aspect of all brick and mortar retail, they have uh, all of their buy online, pick up in store uh, services available. And then there's also added features for sort of member benefits, you know, vending machines to get you uh, members only perks and that sort of thing. So it's really this idea of creating this curated assortment. Um, oops, sorry. This curated assortment and that is um, much more authentic and, and, and fitting with the local community. Uh, the next category uh, that I focused on was customization, and it's something that's been around for it's been around for years. Brands like Puma and Nike have been uh, really leading the way in creating these in-store customization experiences. A lot of times, they're um, you, know, you pick up all of the pieces and parts that you want, give it to the the staff. They sort of you know they send it away, or and then you know six you know four or six weeks later, you get your product. So there's kind of a disconnect in what that customization experience is. You have a little bit of experience and then you kind of have to, you know, just kind of sit back and wait. So brands are really starting to try to step up to um, bring that experience into a way that, you know, customer can actually be involved and witness the making of the product and then actually leave the store with something. So you don't have that disconnect from the initial excitement of uh, customizing your product to when you finally get to take it uh, or actually wear it. So at the Nike House of Innovation, which is this amazing six floor flagship store with uh, that really pays homage to Nike's uh, design process throughout the years and really uh, pays, hair, uh, pays respect to everything that they've done to innovate in the, uh, in the field of sportswear. And they have um, one of the best uh, customization departments um, out right now where as you enter there's this really uh, 360 uh, counter with staff to help you decide what you might want to customize what the options might be and then once you kind of pick and choose uh, all your samples you get to actually watch a staff um, dip dye embroider uh, and embellish and paint uh, whatever that product is you get to watch that happen and then actually leave with the product so you're creating that direct uh, excitement and um, gratification of um, creating something and then actually getting to leave with that product. So Nike is really, um, they've been setting the benchmark and they continue to be one of the benchmarks in uh, in-store customization. Another example um, of customization done in a really great and clever way is uh, the Freitag store. Uh, this one is in Zurich, Switzerland, and it's a customization only store. So the whole purpose is to go into the store, you get to pick every piece and part and zipper and strap and fabric for, uh, for the bag that you want to create. And then uh, you can watch it be made in-house or you can go and continue shopping, come back in a couple hours and your one of a kind bag will be completed. And they sort of create some drama and some, uh, some theater in the store by utilizing uh, this um, dry cleaner conveyor system to show you some of the finished products and some of the available uh, fabric swatches and options. Um, and it's just a way to really get the customer involved in that creation process uh, as part of that as part of that experience. And another way that um, some brands are really starting to um, try to bring an experience or an added layer of experience into the stores is through this infusion of art. And I think this is probably one of the um, more difficult um, ways of bringing this in-store experience to your customers because it, it either works or it doesn't. It has to be very, very authentic. You have to have somebody who is going to be, you know, uh, have that curator eye to bring the right art to, you know, to complement your product. Um, but one of the brands that's really doing a great job of this is Gentle Monster, a, a, an eyewear brand out of Korea. And their stores, in their stores, the product almost becomes secondary uh, to these amazing uh, one-of-a-kind art installations that, you know, every store has a different installation and it has a very rich and uh, complex story behind, uh, you know, that art piece. And it's somehow tied in through, you know, in-store messaging, they'll explain how it's tied in with, 
you know, what their product is or where they're current, where they're currently innovating with their eyewear or that season's collection of eyewear. So there's a direct synergy between um, what they're doing with their product and who they're partnering with for that art artistic expression. So it's, um, it's really effective if, if you're good at it. And right now they, you know, gentle monster is, um, is one of the best and they've actually um, been tasked with uh, curating all of the art for um, a very um, over the top uh, shopping mall in China that is full of you know art installations and it's more, almost more gallery space than retail space. So they actually worked with Gentle Monster to curate all of the art for that installation as well. So there's definitely this movement towards bringing um, the product up to that level of art and um, when you when you pair your product with the light for the right layer of art or the right type of art, it can really you know elevate the product uh, in a really uh, compelling way. So I, I think that's um, a really interesting way to just bring that added layer of experience into the store. Uh, another um, category, and this is um, really kind of where things come full circle is this idea of add on services and how can you know the brick and mortar store really become more than a store so uh, what else can you provide for your customers to make them um, be loyal to the brand make them come back make them uh, you know spend more money that's you know the, always the ultimate goal but how can you build that brand loyalty and uh, how can you service the customer in that in that way through added on services so uh, Nordstrom local is really uh, one of the industry leaders in taking all of the add-on services that many of their large format stores have and really distilling them down from 140,000 square feet down to uh, 3,000 square feet. So you have, you know, you have a tailor, you have trunk shows, you have um, all your online pickup and returns, um, stylists, manicures, coffee shops. So they've really packed a whole lot of added add-on features and benefits into this one small store. Um, Levi's is also doing a similar thing where they've created this really uh, focused store in San Francisco called their next gen store that really uh, takes again takes this breadth of uh, e commerce data that they've collected to create a real focused uh, product offering. And so, and they were also one of the first stores to really start building around the problems and the solutions that were needed from COVID. So they um, we're one of the first to have a, a really well integrated app with in-store experience for curbside pickup, uh, line queuing, uh, personal shopping appointments, things that keep people safe. There are types of experiences that we don't really think of, and it's not the warm and fuzzy type, but you know, at the time that the store opened, that was what customers needed. That was the experience they needed. So um, they were able to provide that in a really seamless way. And then offering some add-on in-store services in more of a tactile, old-fashioned approach. So you have the digital, and then you have that tactile tailor shop to make alterations. So you always, uh, you know, get this idea that Levi's is, you know, reinforcing their, uh, you know, their dominance in the denim industry. Uh, so, so what's next? You know, so where where does retail go from here? And it's something that I've been, you know, thinking a lot about as I've been building this presentation, and you know, just in the 18 months that we've had to kind of sit around and uh, try to decide what the next steps are for retail. And I think you'll start to see a lot of these trends start to distill down into more mainstream brands. And I think uh, I think some will do it well, some won't do it well. And I think if you know if, if a brand is wants to you know stay relevant you know they need to kind of react faster i think that's what we're learning is that the industry is starting to change at a rapid rate that if they're not you know ready or willing to make some of the steps to bring these experiences to the customers you know i think they'll be left behind by some some of these other brands that are doing it better um, perfect oh my goodness Thank you so much for that, Jonathan. It was fantastic. Um, I want to open the floor up to questions um, with uh, anybody who wants to drop stuff into the Q&A or into the chat. But I have some questions to just get us started, if that's all right. Absolutely. Um, I would love to know. So I'm listening really hard to what you're offering. And I'm hearing that there are like threads in here of experiences, education, experiences like personalization as 
community, delight and play, art. And I'm wondering um, in that sort of um, like cocktail of options that are in the retail experience uh, process, which things seem to you to be the most significant in designing it for the customer? I think, um, I think it depends a lot on the brand and kind of to, not trying to dodge the answer, but I think it really depends on the brand and what, what that brand is about, what, what, it, what that added experience um, would mean to that customer. So if you look at Kith, for example, you know, it was perfect for them to have this, uh, you know, irreverent, uh, you know, cereal bar that offers like mixes of cereal and milk and stuff. Cause that fits with this sort of uh, streetwear culture, this youth, this energy. I think um, what's more imp most important, I think is maybe it's the add on features. If I had to pick one, it's just this idea of what else can that store do? So um, trying to fit in ways of just giving uh, giving the store an added life um, through, you know, whether it's just a food offering or, um, you know, an add-on service to, you know, make their product better. I think those, those sorts of things, those add-on features are what's uh, probably most important. Yeah, I love it. Well, well what about this? Um, if you think about your own process or your team's process for designing for um, experiential retail, um, what are some of the sort of core principles that you tend to put into play or some key questions that you ask as you're in process? Well, I, th I think some come, um, some unfortunately come from, you know, as a designer, they come from, you know, what do we think the that brand is actually capable of doing? Uh, like I said earlier on, you know, 10, 12 years ago, we would pitch some of these ideas to brands and they would, you know, they just weren't going to be moving the ball in that way. Now, now clients and, and, and brands are much more uh, open to doing that. So I think knowing what is appropriate, knowing what, you know, could succeed. Because the worst thing you want to do is carve out a whole section of the store for a certain experience and then have it sit empty 80% of the time. You know, we actually saw that happen with the Times Square store for Aeropo Style. We gave them this wonderful uh, second level window onto Times Square where you're interacting with the, um, the digital uh, sign, the LED sign, and then we gave them all this programming for what they could do with it. And it, it really got underutilized. So um, I think knowing what the limitations are, because I think as designers, we just want to throw everything in the kitchen sink at brands. And so I think the best thing that we can do is kind of, you know, be, think of ourselves, you know, put ourselves in that brand's shoes and understand, you know, what is true to them, what is authentic to them, um, and what, what, the, what we think that they can um, succeed with. I think that was that would uh, be what makes you know as a consultant you know a successful design something that they can actually run with once we step away. That makes sense. So so your background as a CCAD alum, like you said, is in industrial design, um, and I'm thinking about the kind of work that you're doing in ex experiential design for retail and. Um, I find myself wondering what other backgrounds people are bringing to the work. Like, are they largely coming from industrial and towards it? Are they coming from, like, say, theater and towards it? What it, what are the teams constituted of in terms of their backgrounds? I think you'll see. I mean, maybe not. You know, maybe more of what I'm looking ahead and, and predicting is that you'll see a lot more people coming from, say, the digital marketing branding world um, and kind of bringing some of those bigger ideas of kind of how everything starts to link together. And you have that very tired old world, you know, or old word omni-channel, you know, so it's, but it is sort of that. It's how do we start to blend all these different influences that people have? So I think that the idea of digital and, you know, app building and uh, user interface and user experience, um, all of those sorts of things, I think really add a layer of, uh, of that experience to, uh, you know, the traditional interior designer. Um, yeah. Well, for that traditional interior designer, um, what are some of your recommendations if they want to move in this direction? Like what sort of skills should they be trying to build? How do they make the step towards um, sort of feeling capable around doing this kind of work? Yeah, I think uh, as funny as it sounds, um, go shop. You know, really being out there and seeing what's out there is really... 
some of the best training. I mean, obviously in school you learn, you know, valuable things about, you know, more specific problem solving solutions and, uh, and that's very, very important. But when it comes to retail, it is really all about trends and knowing what's next and knowing what's already out there. So just, you know, going to the mall, but when you go into the mall, don't just, you know, go shop for whatever you need, but look around, look at the ceiling, look at the floor, look at the lighting, look at the fixtures, how things are put together and kind of, you know, start to analyze the store and, you know, kind of look at things a little bit differently. The same way if you were an industrial designer and you start to, you know, take apart your, uh, your pencil sharpener, you're looking at your phone and you're studying all the curves and the radiuses and the texture of the material. It's kind of a similar thing. It's just really immersing yourself in it. And then I think you'll start to see how um, you start to notice those trends and, and it'll start to sort of click for you once you, you know, then have the foundation of all the problem solving and you know, design process that you've learned in school. And that makes sense. Is that where you look for inspiration in this work is looking to sort of see what else is out there in the field or are there other things like uh, like our art galleries, or I, I guess I'm looking at this, I'm thinking about organizations like Meow Wolf that are doing these massive experiential things that are more about um, something like a closer to like a theme park than yeah. a retail environment. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that whole, the Meow Wolf and the uh, Museum of Ice Cream, and there was a Museum of Happiness, I think it was called, I can't remember. Uh, but there was this whole trend of these experiential places where it was just to go and kind of cut loose and run around like a kid again. And so there's definitely some, some, uh, some best practices to glean from that. Um, so yeah, just looking around at you know, um, yeah, art galleries, anybody who's doing something in, in the public space to kind of engage with uh, people in, a, in, in, in an interesting way, whether it's through an art installation or it's through, um, you know, uh, putting a restaurant in a unique location or, you know, turning, I don't know, this is any time that you see a place where people want to congregate and are uh, being social and being curious and, uh, and engaging, you know, there's probably something to take from there and kind of bring back into the retail space and say, okay, that's working, you know, how do we, you know, fit that in with, you know, kind of what we're trying to create here. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think that's a super place for us to bring this to sort of a pause. So um, I want to say thank you so much to you for coming back to your alma mater through the digital space um, and sharing your expertise with us. Um, and if this talk resonated with you and you want to learn more about how you can be one of the leaders who will shape the future of retail, you can check out CCAD's Master of Professional Studies in Retail Design. I just put a link to it there in the chat. Um, or you can uh, reach out to me um, directly. That's my email. If you you want to ask any questions about it we're enrolling right now for our first cohort in january of 2022 and we want to take on big questions like what jonathan is offering up for us today how do you design for this particular moment um so uh, thank you all for joining us tonight um we have more of these cc80 knows re retail webinars on the horizon um and i'm putting a link to that in there um weekly throughout the fall so please come back and see us again next time we'll be talking about the future of pop-ups which is related um, to what we were talking about today, I think. Um, thank you, Jonathan. I really appreciate Absolutely. your time. Have a good rest of your evening, everybody.